Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, February 4th, and this is a weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or in this video is not to be taken as investment advice. This is just a general conversation. You should consult with a financial advisor. I am not a financial advisor. I cannot give you financial advice. All I do is talk about what I'm doing and my views and perceptions on the markets. You should not take advice off the internet. You should do your own research. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so we had a viewer question come in that, well, somebody emailed me some of these questions. I wanted to address it uh, publicly uh, just because I think it'd be for everybody's benefit. And uh, so basically respect your opinion. So I wanna ask, and I am losing my mind. Am I losing my mind or is oil not the best trade in the world right now by far? What am I missing? Well, from a trade perspective, I mean, look guys, we were talking about investing in oil you know i talked about it long before many other people you know back in 2018 we were seeing a recovery we got rug pulled by the trump administration and the saudis and the russians but that's okay then we got then we got hit with covid you know our thesis has always been there's been a dearth of investment there's been a lack of reinvestment in the oil industry um in the last couple years that investment has been or lack thereof has been exacerbated by now this worldwide crazy push at least in the western democracies for esg and climate change you guys know the drill we've talked about this many times and so you know when we had the covid rug pull on the economy um, and oil traded negative, we were buying, right? You know, I just talked about it last week that I've sold my Athabasca oil. That was something I talked about publicly at the time. I think we were buying it. I was recommending it at like 15 or 18 cents. I think I've, I sold most of it last week for like a buck 25, a buck 30. I mean, that's almost a 10 bagger. Some of the shares I think were higher than that that I sold. So I'm out of that. But that was like the ultimate time to be buying, right? Do I think there's still opportunity in oil stocks? Yes, I do. Um, do I think it's going to be the same type of returns that we saw earlier? No, because we were buying literally when there was blood in the streets. We were buying when the world was coming apart, when all the sediment, all the news was negative towards energy and oil. As a matter of fact, you had all the talking heads out there, all of the masters of the universe, all of the pointy shoes, remember? Well, this is our opportunity, right? While we're locked down, you can see CO2 going down. This is the time to transition. We're gonna build back better. Remember all the politicians in every country saying the same thing? What they forgot was you can't have an energy transition in a year or two. Energy transitions cannot be dictated from above by politicians. And we're going to get into some of that other, some of this, why, you know, the view that I've had, you know, I say it sarcastically, but I don't mean it sarcastically. Heads we win, tails we win more. And I'm going to get into that further on into this video. But getting back to this question, yes, there's still opportunity in, in oil stocks. It's not the same opportunity that existed, you know, 18 months ago or a year ago. Um, there's still a view uh, that, you know, oil's going away. It's not going away. You're going to be using oil for the rest of your life. People listening to this, your children will be using oil for the rest of their lives. People don't understand where a barrel of oil goes. It's not just let's all get Teslas and plug them in and oil goes away. That's not accurate. Um, we've talked about that before. So yes, I believe that there's still opportunity in select shares. And so it goes on here, the question or the email, Heard Nuttall, talking about Eric Nuttall, Nine Point Partners up in Canada, whose energy fund was up 186% last year, say the other day that demand destruction would occur at $140 a barrel, but we've got governments handing out subsidies for these high prices already on top of devaluing their currencies globally, blocking land leases for wells, restricting investments for capital. You know this list is long. And even after these extremes, 
runs last year, some of these oil companies are cheaper now at $90 a barrel. Is this my inexperience or would you be inclined to agree? This is absolutely everything that this person said is true. In fact, um, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to contemplate now. What is the oil price that will curtail demand? I mean, you're already seeing it like in the UK and several other countries where the governments. So what should happen in a, in, in a laissez-faire, in a normal market economy, as the price of oil goes up, it will begin to ration it demand, okay? Uh, people at the margins that are just goofing off on jet skis or taking the extra trips or whatever, they'll stop doing that, right? Um, people that are wasting energy, people will be inclined to do other things except pay $5 a, gas, a gallon for gasoline. So that higher price will have a tendency to curtail demand. You're not going to get demand curtailments if the governments are going to just create fiat currency and give it to people to subsidize their energy use in the midst of an energy crisis. That's dumb, but it goes back to what we said before. This is how we make the big money, by capitalizing on these dumb policies, these ridiculous politicians, that these know-nothings. I, I, want, I want one of you statists that listen to this, these videos to come on here in the comments and tell me why you think Boris Johnson or Joe Biden or any of these schlubs know a darn thing about energy. They, I, I've said it before. I wouldn't, every politician I've ever seen or met has been a bum. That's all they are is bums asking for money all the time, scheming and scamming, you know, Nancy Pelosi with the stock trade. I mean, it just goes on forever. These people are, are, they're horrible. And you you think they're going to solve the energy problem? They're not going to solve the energy problem. So, yes, everything you're saying here is correct. So I don't know, you know, if they're going to continue subsidizing people's usage so it's they don't have to make changes to curtail demand, then I don't know it's going to curtail demand. Now, demand will get curtailed in the emerging markets because those governments will not have the ability to subsidize their populations. And why do these governments want to subsidize? Because they want to stay in power, right? Some, you know, the boobus Americanus and the rest of the, uh, you know, hoi polloi in the Western democracies that don't have a clue, which is most people, you know, when what, gasoline's $5 a gallon or whatever it's going to be this summer, somebody needs to do something. Well, you're the one that bought a 3,500 square foot house out in uh, Bloomington or out in Burnsville and you're commuting to downtown Minneapolis in an SUV, who told you to do that? You know, people don't have a clue. Somebody needs to do something. Politicians, somebody needs to do, so they're gonna, they'll, do, they'll do stuff. They'll make dumb decisions to compound on top of the dumb decisions that were made by previous uh, politicians. So what I'm trying to tell you is I don't know how high a barrel of oil is gonna go. I will tell you that there's not enough oil to meet the demand that's coming as these economies open back up. And just the fact that we've talked about before, the depletion that needs to be replaced every year, along with the million to a million and a half, one to one and a half percent worldwide growth that's happening because of the emerging markets. You know, these are spreadsheet exercises. You can take the populations of these various countries and juxtapose them against, you know, what the average use, bar, uh, average oil usage is per person in a lot of these other developing countries, and you start you know, seeing things like 120, 130 million barrels a day, 10, 15 years down the road. The world is not making sufficient investments to even uh, supply the oil that's needed now. And if politicians are gonna make it worse by subsidizing oil use or energy usage, then you're not gonna get a demand destruction, you, except for in the emerging markets, the people that can least afford it, by the way. So yes, you have uh, ESG. I mean, think if you're like a board, you know, we've seen this already. We've seen some reports come out like Exxon and Suncor. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to get into them this week, but like Suncor, for example, people were like, um, they're prioritizing their debt pay downs. Okay. What board of directors is going to go out there and announce a major project in this political and social wokeness environment? You don't have to do that. All you have to do is give the market what it wants, which is debt repayment and return of capital to shareholders via um, buybacks and dividends. That's, and you're good. 
your, your, your couple million dollars a year or whatever you're getting as CEO and your stock options, you're going to be good because the stock price is going to go up. There's no reason to go out and take big risks and drill all over the place offshore um, and, and, and announce a, a new oil sands project up in Canada in the current political environment. Who would do that? Who would risk their position to do that? <clears throat> I mean, these people that run these companies are not stupid. Everybody responds to incentives. So, yes, I would say that on a cash flow basis return, I mean, I'm going to put an, uh, a video up of Eric Nuttall getting interviewed last week, or maybe it was earlier this week, I can't remember. And he talks about this exact thing about just in the Canadian oil patch, that the average company with the cash flows at 90 or $100 a barrel, which he's forecasting, the whole industry can buy itself go private, well, theoretically, buy all the shares back in three years, 2.6 to three years. What do you think these companies are going to do? They're going to spend the sustaining capital they need to spend to maintain production. And then they're going to respond to what, you know, the market is telling them they want. The market's not saying they want growth for the sake of growth. They're telling these companies to pay down their debt and to return capital to shareholders and the share prices will go up. Now, we're not going to get the 10 baggers probably, but they're still there's still, you know, these are still good investments, I think, over the next year to 18 months. Um, I think there's exceptional value in the oil field services. That's just now starting to get sniffed out by people. Yes, you know, just because, you know, there are companies drilling, there are things happening, and it doesn't have to be a big boom in, in spending for these companies to do well, because we've talked about this before. The oil field services sector has atrophied, has shrunk because of the depression that this market was in. So there's not that many companies, there's not that many resources. The manpower, all, all these things have dissipated over the last couple of years. You know, you can't just leave equipment sitting in a yard, uh, it deteriorates very quickly. And so bringing some of this equipment back and you know, bearing seas up, motors go bad, pumps, you know, uh, get the seals go bad on them. There's all kinds of things. And this all costs money to bring back on. And you're not going to be in a rush to do that if you're already running, like Halliburton said in their recent, um, uh, recent uh, conference call that they're sold out for, for, for their fracking, for the, okay? So, I mean, this, that's the statement, right? Halliburton is sold out. So we're seeing this across the patch. We're seeing drill pipe shortages, manpower shortages, equipment shortages. So there will be spending. People will have to do maintenance capital. There will be independent operators that go out there and spend money, um, not necessarily your publicly traded companies. But uh, there, there is, there is gonna, going to be drilling. There is going to be some increased spending. And I think that it's going to trickle down on to the oil field services um, industry or sector, which has atrophied greatly. And I think the remaining uh, players, the remaining companies that are still active, will see a uh, they will see a, the benefit of that. So I think that's an opportunity. And so we get down to the last question here. Um, is there a specific source you could recommend to deep dive oil companies? So obviously I recommend that you have to do your own work. You cannot rely on other people to do the work for you. This is also not a market where you could just go out and buy an ETF. If you go out and buy the XLE or something like that, yes, you'll, you'll, you'll do okay. But if you're looking for the type of returns for the kind of risk you're taking, then you need to uh, deep dive this and put some work in. Uh, that's some of the things we do in actionable intelligence. That's why I recommend people subscribe. Um, but we're diversified, right? We're not just in oil. We're in a lot of things, energy, uh, other things that are um, uh, underpriced, not necessarily just all oil all the time. But what I will do is I will, on this next slide, I'm going to show you, these are people that I follow for information on oil. You know, I'm a generalist speculator slash investor. I don't just focus on energy. I'm in the energy industry. I know a lot about energy, uh, but this is not the only thing that I focus on. You need to realize that eventually this market will peak out, talking about the energy market, and go into decline. It's a cyclical industry. Right now, we're in the middle of the beginning parts of a boom, in my view. 
uh, an energy crisis that's being exacerbated by bad policy choices. And so uh, I don't know how high it goes. Um, I don't like to speculate on that. I think that, uh, you know, I'm shocked. I mean, I'm looking at oil right now. I'm doing this on um, Friday morning, putting this together. And I'm looking at an oil price of, let's see here, 93.28 on Brent and 92.62 on WTI. I mean, guys, you know, anything above $70 a barrel in these companies, in these small and mid cap oil producers in Canada that we've been that we've been talking about are just minting cash. So here's some of the people that I follow uh, to get ideas to uh, these people are, are are in it to they are knee deep in the energy uh, markets every day. This is a lot of Twitter. This is why I tell people to get on Twitter and you need to cultivate, get this, you know, cultivate this, who you're going to follow on Twitter. You know, Twitter is not for just, you know, talking about, you know, how much you hate Trump or how much you hate Biden. Who cares about all that? What you should be focusing on is the great access to these great minds that are on there talking about this particular industry. And they will give you some good ideas where you can start. So Eric Nuttall, obviously nine point partners. Um, we called them the last of the Mohicans during the uh, the last guy man standing in the Canadian oil patch as an investor uh, advocating for it in the depths of the uh, turmoil from the pandemic, never gave up the thesis uh, and now uh, doing very well. Should follow him. He, he writes columns in the Financial Post. He gets interviewed on BNN. Uh, I would definitely uh, listen to uh, what he has to say. Josh Young, Bison Interests, um, very uh, <laughs> insightful guy, a guy that participates quite a bit on Twitter. Um, I would follow him. Let me check something real quick. Yeah. Um, so I'd follow him. Here's some other two guys here that I would follow. These guys have really come to my attention. Um, they do a lot of work on Twitter. They host spaces. Uh, the first guy, I hope I pronounced names right. So Sohaib Abbas, this guy hosts all kinds of Twitter spaces. He gets top-notch guests in there. They do these sometimes three, four. They did an eight-hour session the other day. I mean, you can get on there and ask all the questions you want about particular companies, and there will be somebody on that Twitter spaces. I can guarantee you that um, that uh, has deep dive that particular company or has a view on it. And I'm not saying you just go out then right there while you're listening to the spaces and buy the company. Okay, what you should do then is say, okay, well, there seems to be a consensus view around people that spend a lot of time doing this, that so-and-so XYZ company uh, seems to have decent prospects. Let me take a look at it. Let me see if what they're saying is accurate. Excuse me. The next guy, uh, Shubham Garg, I goes at, as White Tundra SG on Twitter. This guy... Another guy that does a lot of good work. He hosts spaces. He does these educational spaces. He talks about how to uh, evaluate, how to value what you should be looking for in these energy companies, in these oil companies. Top notch. Uh, I would definitely uh, follow that guy. Um, HFI Research, somebody else I've been following for a couple of years. They're on Seeking Alpha. They're also on Twitter. They do a lot of tracking of um, inventories and their views on, um, on you know, the oil supply and things like that have been pretty much spot on. Javier Blas, I would follow this person just for overall commodity. Um, he talks a lot about energy, but he's overall commodity guy. Uh, Alexander Stahel, he runs a fund in Switzerland. Uh, he's he's pretty active in the commodity space talking about things. You can get a lot of good ideas from this guy. He's becoming more active on some of the spaces. He's hosted some spaces recently about uh, some specific company. Um, Tracy Shuchard, shy girl. She's pretty good. She's an energy analyst. Uh, I would follow her. She gets interviewed quite a bit. She has some uh, decent views. And then somebody I think that's underfollowed, but uh, writes on oilprice.com and, and now has a sub stack and, and starting to do videos is Arena Slav. 
Um, she's from Bulgaria, but uh, she's pretty good uh, on her general outlook on energy. She hosted a, uh, she had a call the other day on Zoom with some other analysts. And it was interesting because we were talking about that whole heads I win, tails I win more, and which I'm going to talk about more in this video about, you know, this energy, so-called energy transition that these politicians and the, you know, World Economic Forum and the masters of the universe are advocating. But on the other hand, they're blocking investment in all these new mines. So uh, evidently, there seems to be some kind of disconnect in the thinking that you're going to have an energy transition and you need millions of tons of minerals to be mined. And they're doing everything they can to block mineral extraction. So uh, I thought that was uh, pretty good insights there. Um, so these are some people that I follow. This isn't all the people. But this gives you a good start. You, you go on Twitter and follow these people. I'm going to leave this up for a second just so you can, you know, screenshot it if you want, whatever. You start following these people, getting on the spaces. You'll start finding out who are people that actually know what they're talking about. People that, you know, you can rely on the information they're saying. You can begin to, you know, get some ideas here to get you going. You have to be very selective in my view going forward. You can't just buy ETFs now in the energy space. You need to get specific. You need to um, know where these people have their production, what the, you know, what's going on in the particular locations, the managements. I mean, some of these managements have very good histories where they've had serial success and some of them are not very good. I mean, this is one of the reasons I got out of Athabasca. I mean, there's no institutional support for that stock. It's all retail. The company is not one of the best companies to uh, bet on going forward. So these are some of the things you will learn uh, as you do your own research and you listen to, you know, you start building a consensus around certain names. So that would be my advice. Uh, that's who, where I would start. You have to do the work. You have to put some time in. Um, and, but the, I, I do think that the rewards are there. I do think that there are many companies that are five baggers at least still. Um, and, you know, you just got to do, do the work and figure out, you know, what, what the, you know, capital return policies are looking like, what's the growth looking like. There are companies that are growing production. Um, we've got one in the portfolio that's probably going to double production. Um, they had some pipeline issues and takeaway issues. Those are relieved now. And we're going to see cash flow. I mean, what, what do you want to see? Production doubling into, you know, an oil price that's up 20% already this year. Um, so that's tremendous for cash flows, right? And then that's going to lead to, if you have some sustained price activity, like we're thinking, um, you know, you're going to see some revaluations and re-analysts um, come out. I mean, people are going to, people with money, you know, as we see this transition, you know, from out of growth to value or fake growth to value stocks, um, people are going to be looking for those returns, right? You, you know, if you're paying a, a five, six, 10% dividend and it's growing and you're buying back shares, that's going to attract capital, right? That's going to lead to a re-rating of your stock. And if you're not participating in those as a fund manager, you're going to lag every other other people. And when you lag, that's your death sentence, right? If you're running money. All right. So here we go. Uh, shale oil producers. This is why, you know, when you hear people talk about, well, shale will ramp up, uh, take care of it. That, that doesn't look like that's going to happen, right? Um, shale oil producers brace for the end. So you have a, a Pioneer, which is one of the largest uh, shale operators in the U.S., so CEO Sheffield says he has 15 to 20 years of inventory remaining at his current drilling pace. But if he tried growing 15 to 20%, he'd run out in eight years. Same issue for everyone else. At that rate, you'll drill up your inventories, even the good companies. So this is a Wall Street Journal article. I didn't have access to it. But this is something that we've heard several of these CEOs say. And it goes back to what we said before. You're not going to, the, the shale boom is over. It's not coming back. Um, a lot of these companies are going to maximize shareholder return. Uh, the capital is not there for them to just go out and waste it and not have cash flow and not have earnings. Um, those days are over with. 
Now, there are independent operators. There are always going to be wildcatters. There's going to be people out there uh, that we don't hear about that are not publicly traded companies that are drilling. That is happening. But will it be sufficient to replace? Uh, no, it will not, because quite frankly, you've drilled out most of the good locations over the last 10 years. You know, ever since I I've had this view about, you know, that we live on this globe, this ball, and, you know, we found all the easy oil. And we had this respite when we had this shale revolution, which I basically f said several years ago that. I, be, I felt was just financed by 0% interest rates and, um, you know, large S from Wall Street because of low and low interest rate environment. And so we basically ran through, you know, eight to 10 years. We had that bounty of oil production becoming energy independent, whatever you want to call it. And now it looks like, you know, that's over with. So now what? What do you do now? So um, this is a video, I'll put it, a link to it, Eric Nuttall. We're about to see the most bullish catalyst for oil in modern history. Um, some of the things he talks about in this video, one of the things I like, the interviewer asked him, what about you know Iran oil coming back to market? Um, a deal with, yes, I believe the Biden administration in desperation because um, with oil at, you know, with gasoline prices going up and we have a congressional election cycle and, you know, what is it, 10 months. And the fact that we are very likely gonna be over $100 a barrel, we're gonna be seeing close to $4 gallon gasoline, these people are gonna get wiped out. And so they're gonna be in desperation mode to try to get as much oil on the market as possible. And, um, you know, people vote with their pocketbooks. And so, you know, once Iran, I mean, Iran is already exporting oil when it officially, maybe they can, I don't know how much they can ramp up if they're officially allowed to just go that route. That's one of the things I think that will finally get answered. And then what do you do after that? What's after that? Because we know OPEC is not hitting their quotas. Okay. That's another thing I think is going to become mainstream thought this year. And he talks about in this video, that's going to become mainstream thought this year. And that is going to lead to, that could lead to a panic. That could lead to a spike in prices. When the market comes to the realization that demand is unquenchable, it's growing, it's going to continue to grow. And we haven't made the necessary investments. And there is no, you know, the phone was picked up by OPEC. And they said, we don't have the capacity. The international majors are not investing in oil. They're out do, uh, doing wokeism. In investing in offshore wind, um, who, who's picking up the slack here? Okay, it's not going to be the shale guys. It's not going to be OPEC. It's not going to be the international oil companies. Who's do, who's going to pick up the slack? And uh, it's not just going to be Iran. So, a uh, good video. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. So another thing I want to talk about, which I think is positive, even with the Iran situation. Um, this is from Tankers International, they track tankers. The VLCC, very large crude carrier market, is moving towards an equilibrium where demand is closing in on supply. Well, finally, our data shows Mideast VLCC loadings are back to the pre-pandemic levels. Read more on our blog here. I'll put a link to this. You can go read it. It's a LinkedIn article. But you can see the dip during the pandemic. The loadings were way down. We're back to pre-pandemic levels. VLCC rates are, I think, traded negative last week. So we're not out of the woods yet. The good thing about, well, it's not good for the nuclear situation in Iran and the potential weapons situation, but we're going to stay away from that. If Iran is allowed to rejoin uh, the you know normal normalized oil export situation that the rest of the world's in one of the things that i think will be helpful to the veal for, for the oil tanker market is a lot of the rogue tankers that they're using because there's sanctions on iran right you can't do business with iran so you have all these rogue operators out there and these guys are these are old tankers that have not been surveyed in shipyards recently they're not certified they're dangerous they're old and i think that uh, if iran's allowed to to re-enter the oil market the international oil market officially they're going to have to they'll have to move away from using those uh those tankers and they will have to use you know certified 
uh, tankers with the right paperwork that have been surveyed properly. And that so that puts additional additional demand on the tanker market, right? They're not going to be allowed to just, you know, use, you know, uh, Captain Jacks uh, and his uh, rogue Filipino crew on some junky 25 year old tanker that's leaking oil all over the place. That's not going to be allowed. So that's one positive situation we could see. I haven't given up on this tanker trade. I still hold positions. Um, they're not doing that well. Uh, let's be frank. But you know, I talked about the situation in what happened earlier in the life of the actionable intelligence alert newsletter portfolio, where I owned a company, a uh, container ship company, which was terrible. Uh, it was a terrible company. It's called uh, East uh, Euro Seas. They re really have these smaller container ships, but I sold it out, right? Even though uh, the, 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 the ships were selling, they had an older fleet, they were selling way below net asset value, yada, 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 the same type of narrative that we have in VLCC. So then you see what happened. I mean, I could not forecast that we were going to have this pandemic and then all these shipping issues. That stock went from when I sold it for like under $2, I think it's recently or it traded as high as $30. So um, that's what can happen in a shipping bull cycle if circumstances line up. So it looks like, at least for tankers, if we're a little bit more patient, it looks like that, you know, we could get a recovery in the tanker market and no one's building any tankers, guys. And if every day that goes by, the fleet gets older, right? The majority of the fleet is getting older and older. And it gets to a point where, you know, if you understand what the new emissions requirements that are coming up in the next couple of years, a lot of these old tankers are going to have to go away and there's not new ones being built. So I'm not saying we're going to have a tanker super cycle this year, but I think that we're on a path towards recovery. Let me put it that way. So here's Luke Groman. I like following this guy. He's kind of a macro guy. He was going over this Goldman Sachs. I'll put a link to this tweet so you can read the Goldman Sachs uh, work. But here's what he says. In plain English, he's talking about the gold, his interpretation of the Goldman um, paper that he's reviewing. There isn't enough oil at prices that don't blow up the economy to fund the level of GDP growth needed so that the debt doesn't blow up the economy. But if prices rise enough to get enough oil without blowing up the economy, it will blow up the debt. Got that? Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you another tweet here from Chris Martinson, another guy I follow that's pretty good. He's been pretty good on the pandemic, but he's been a long-term guy talking about you know our issues that we have here in the West about our over indebtedness, our reliance on globalism, our hollowing out of our middle class and our working classes in the West. But this is exactly right. You know, I'm, I'm still not convinced that, and this is veering off into conspiracy theory. Some people don't like this, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I'm still not convinced that the masters of the universe are as dumb as sometimes I think they are. I think they understand the debt situation. I think they can look at the fact that we look at the same thing, that oil is not going to be in sufficient supply to power this world economy, if you will. That's going to lead to conflict. And so that's why I think a, a big part of this ESG movement and this push for climate change activism is to restrict the demand for fossil fuels. Now, the problem is, is that <laughs> the other people in the world aren't going to participate, uh, you know. If you take the United States, Europe, and some of the Anglophone countries that are woke like this, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, I mean, you're not even at a billion people. And so the other 6 billion people in the world, you know, is China going to go along? We already know no. India, no. Indonesia, you can go down the list. Philippines, these countries that have tens of millions of people. In Indonesia's case, you have 250 million people living there. Nobody even talks about the place. So. You know, is the plot afoot that they realize that no, there is like I talked about that video that Arena Slav made, you know, with those other uh, analysts. You know, in order to have this energy transition to what they're talking, what these politicians are talking about, it's going to take tr tens of trillions of dollars and be hundreds. Listen to what I'm saying: 
hundreds of millions of tons of copper, nickel, uh, cobalt. I mean, anything you can think of, aluminum, all these things, they don't exist. They don't exist. They just had a mining conference in Saudi Arabia last month, middle of last month, and they were talking about this. They had all the big players there. This is it, same thing. Insufficient investment has been made in order to make this transition happen. And I'm going to show you examples where, at least in the United States, we're talking about these things. So, you know, you need to think about this. You're not going to have this. We're all going to go out and buy a Tesla or an Audi electric car. We're going to plug it in. And then, you know what? Oil is going to go away because oil is used, you know, only 25% of a barrel of oil is used for transportation, guys. The rest is used for all the other stuff in your house. Plastics, dyes, paints, medicines. I can go on forever. Okay. You're not going to replace that with electricity generated by a solar panel. You know, where are you going to get these mines from? You need an Escondida every, every year. Okay. Just to, just to replace what we mine. We're in the same situation you are with oil. Insufficient investment. Forget about, forget about growing and supplying all these metals and minerals that you need for this energy transition. This is what this is what really gets me. Do the do the politicians, do these masters of the universe realize this? And so they're going to lock it all down because they know there's insufficient material to do this. And so the excuse is going to be: you have to accept a lower standard of living because we're going to destroy the climate. When in fact, we simply don't have the ability financially, politically, socially to make this happen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to reduce your standard of living over time. And of course, our standard of living and that will maintain power, right? That's what I think a lot of this is about. Now, you can call me a conspiracy theorist. You can call me whatever you want, but nobody can tell me we're going to get the hundreds of millions of tons of copper and nickel and all these things that we need. No one can tell me how we're going to get to 120, 130 million barrels of oil production over the next 20 years to supply China, India, and everybody else with the oil that they need and want to have the living standards that we have. So what's really going to happen, do you think? If their living standards are going up, ours are going to come down. There's insufficient. I don't even know if the stuff exists to be dug up, okay? Forget about that question. The question is, do we have the will to do it? Do we have the capital to do it? And I would say at this point, no, we don't. So this is an interesting discussion to have. The fallout will be heads we win, tails we win more. Here's Chris Martinson. Um, I suggest you follow this guy too. He's just, just a general smart guy that had the pandemic nailed from day one. I was listening to this guy. He's very smart. This guy has a PhD in, I think, microbiology or something like that. But he's an overall. And here's the quote that I think you need to key on. This Jim Poplava, another guy that I listen to. He's just a general investment guy that runs an investment advisory firm in San Diego. Um, he does the uh, Financial uh, Sense News Hour pretty good. He's just a general guy, but this is a statement he made several years ago. Oil is the new Fed funds rate. I believe that. There's no way, you know, these people are out talking about the Fed's going to raise rates four, five, six times this year. Or how? The, the, the whole economy would collapse. The markets would collapse. And so what I think is going to happen, what I've stated is, is the oil price is going to rise and be that throttle, that governor, if you will, that regulator of the economy. Um, that's what we saw in 2008. I don't think it was necessarily the housing bubble that created the Great Recession. I think it was high energy prices that just tipped the canoe over, it just was unsustainable at $150 a barrel. Um, yes, there was fallout. Yes, there was a bubble in housing and all those things in the big short. I get it. But I think the thing that was the final nail in the coffin was the, you know, with oil prices at $150 a barrel, the world economy just could not continue at that level. And so I think we're heading that way. So what does he say here? Jim Poplava once said, you know, oil is the new Fed funds rate prediction. This will be true, true for the next three to five years. Outlook cycles of oil and debt equals spikes, busts as the chaos works itself out. Cause decades of delusional policy failures and personally weak Fed leadership. I agree. I agree. This, this kind of sums it up. So this is why you have to be switched on. Um, you know, the oil price will get to a sufficient level. It's not a linear thing, guys. You need to, you need to be thinking about this. Oil is a cyclical business. It will get to a certain level, uh, in my view, where the economy will not be, 
be able to function, it will roll over then. You do not want to be holding oil stocks then. They will go down. Uh, I'm not saying that's going to happen in the next month or two or the next year, but I'm telling you that we will get to that level eventually simply because we haven't made sufficient investment. But it won't be a linear trip where they just go up at $150, $200 a barrel and stay there. Uh, the economy can't function properly at those levels. Certainly the emerging markets can't. Or at least we're going to find out, right? So, and then you have this tremendous debt. We're at $30 trillion in debt, guys, in the US. I mean, this is going to go on. You know, I don't like to make predictions because people have been making predictions about the debt forever. But, you know, if you think you're going to raise rates, the Fed's going to raise rates four, five, six times over the next even couple of years into that, there's no way. There's no way. Okay. So um, they're on a high wire act and, you know, hopefully they don't fall off. This is why you have to be nimble though, because things are going to change. Things could change tomorrow. Um, geopolitically, financially, you know, we're in the middle of, 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 a, of a growth stock crash right now. I mean, many besides, you know, I think I saw Facebook was down 20% yesterday or 26% in one day, $200 billion in market cap evaporated. So I haven't checked it this morning. I mean, but I'm just telling you, this is what can happen, right? And so I think that, you know, we're positioned in the right sectors where the cash is going as we see this rotation, this violent rotation. And I think that, you know, we've even seen it here, you know, you have this liquidity issues and everything goes down, right? Because the margin clerks come in and sell people out and people just will sell even stuff that's working because they need the cash. So yeah, you have to be nimble. You can't just buy a, a, an ETF and then go on vacation and, and come back in three years and everything, you'll be you know wealthy. You need to be switched on. You need to be, we're moving from the era of passive investing to active investing. And people that are active investors that actually know what's going on are gonna make a tremendous amount of money. So here we go, right? Record low petroleum discoveries. The red is gas. The green is liquids, that would be oil and condensate. We're just not, you know, we're just not seeing the, the discoveries, guys. We're living off the fruits of previous investment cycles. And, um, you know, like I've said before, the world's consuming 34, 35, 36 billion barrels a year, whatever it is, if I get the calculator out, and you're not replacing that. So that's a problem. Um, is there a price level? I mean, one of the things we found out during the last move when oil topped out at $150 a barrel, that oil companies were ramping uh, spend into that and they still were not able to find sufficient supply. This is disconcerting. You know, the Russians are drilling in the Arctic. You know, people are dil drilling offshore deep water in 10,000, 15,000 feet of water before the drill bit even hits the bottom. These are harsh conditions. The North Sea, um, these are places, you know, uh, if there's, you're being forced out into harsher environments, more complicated environments, more expensive environments uh, to find the sufficient oil and it's not being found. And, you know, if we're going to continue to put pressure on these companies to tell them to transition and spend their money and activities on, and you can see it too, if you go look at the, um, a lot of the presentations, they'll have slide after slide about how they're transitioning to ESG, how they're doing this offshore, some of the service companies, how they're going to provide service to the offshore, offshore wind industry, this kind of stuff. I mean, this is, this is not gonna end well. So um, the world runs on oil, and runs on petroleum. We're finding that out. I'm down here in South Texas today. Uh, at my house down uh, near the uh, border and it's, you know, 32 degrees outside with the wind chill under 30. So um, these, you know, it's not, we're not set up for that down here. And all of, you know, the whole country is in a deep freeze. So um, this is going to have repercussions, right? Uh, you're not going to electrify the economy in a couple of years. And I don't think that you're going to be able to do it Regardless, I don't think, I think that's the narrative, but I don't think it's actually going to happen. I think what's going to happen is a push for you to have a lower standard of living, uh, a more simple standard of living is going to be forced on people uh, because we simply do not have the materials and uh, capacity or 
financial weatherthal to have this huge energy transition. It's just a ploy to train you for a lower standard of living. So here we go, right? So the Biden administration conducted basically the largest offshore oil and gas lease bidding round of all time recently. And it netted, I don't know how many hundreds of million dollars, but a federal judge blocks the offshore lease sale, right? So what happened? A federal court has rejected a plan to lease millions of acres in the Gulf of Mexico for offshore oil drilling, saying the Biden administration did not adequately take into account the lease sales effect on planet warming greenhouse gas emissions, violating a bedrock environmental law. So we've backed ourselves into these corners. Again, heads we win, tails we win more. The decision Thursday by U.S. District Judge Rudolph Contreras in Washington sends the proposed lease back to the Interior Department to decide next steps. The judge said it was up to Interior to decide whether to go forward with the sale after revised review, scrap it, or take other steps. Environmental groups hailed the decision and said the ruling gave President Joe Biden a chance to follow through on a campaign promise to stop offshore leasing in federal waters. The decision was released on the one-year anniversary of a federal leasing moratorium. Mr. Biden ordered as part of his efforts to combat climate change. Mr. Biden is going to be a one-term president. There's going to be a sea change of Republicans taking over the Congress in November. One of the reasons is, is because energy prices are going to be sky high. Okay? Energy prices are going to be sky high. These people are nuts. Okay? Uh, legislation will have to be changed. <laughs> excuse me it's going to take this is going to be a battle right you're going to let a small group of environmental activists and activist judges uh dictate the terms of for the rest of the 300 million people 330 million people in the country it's not going to happen these people are going to get voted out it's just that simple and people are not going to put up with it uh poll after poll has shown that you know if you interview somebody and how you ask the question uh, are you for green energy? Are you for, you know, lowering CO2? Are you for, yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, you know, your energy prices have to double to do that or go higher. Are you for it now? Your standard of living has to go down. No, they're not for it then. They won't even pay. I think they, I saw one poll, the average person won't even pay 10 or $20 more a month to lower CO2, okay? There's no appetite for this, okay? People want their lifestyles. Whether we can do it or not is irrelevant, you know, that, they're, they're not going to vote for this stuff. And, you know, this, this administration is going to be out. $100 oil is going to, that's it. And we're probably going higher. You know, by this summer, we could be at $100 a barrel. This will be the main thing that people are talking about for the congressional elections. And this, this, the, these people are continuing down this path. I mean, they're just, they're just very, there's no thinking going on here. So again, we show you another example here of why, you know, these people talk out of both sides of their mouth. They're either the dumbest people alive, the worst politicians, they don't know how to politic properly, or this is just part of the agenda. I mean, I still haven't figured it out yet. The Interior Department on Wednesday announced the cancellation of two mine leases in Minnesota that have been granted under the Trump administration. The department renewed Twin Metals Minnesota leases for hard rock mining near northeastern Minnesota's Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in 2019. In a legal opinion Wednesday, the department's office of solicitor ruled that the department improperly renewed them. So this is just all political, right? I don't, there's no, I, who knows what the facts are? Who knows how dangerous this mine would be to the, to the, to the Boundary Waters? There's been mining, taconite mining, all kinds of mining going on in Minis upper Minnesota for decades you know they're not going to go dig up the boundary waters okay uh, there's always regulations in place this is a political situation because they don't want mining these these environmental groups okay the environmental groups if, this is why they're not going to be allowed these small groups of wacky activists have the ear of this current administration when the prices go up when the transition doesn't happen, when they've created this big mess and economic chaos, they're going to be voted out. And people that are 
pro mining, pro oil and gas are going to be put back in. That's that simple. You're just going to have, that's why I'm saying this is all tradable. This is almost hilarious. This is almost easy. This is what we look for. Okay. Irrational decisions, poor policy being made. Okay. In the midst of you have the main primary agenda is build back better in energy transition, yet you cannot mine the materials here in the U.S. to provide it. So who are you relying on? Okay. Third world countries, China. Okay. I, I, I'll put up an interview that um, I don't know if it's public or not, but uh, on Financial Sense News Hour, um, this guy, uh, Rick Mills at Ahead of the Curve, he was talking about this with uh, one of the guys at uh, Financial News Network. I think it, uh, hopefully it's a public, uh, it may not be public, but anyways, he has a bunch of articles about this at his website. You know, where are you going to get all these materials to do this build back better in this energy transition? Well, you, you're certainly not going to get them from this mine. And so, you know, this is what you need, right? Copper, nickel, cobalt, and platinum group metals. You know, this is the same thing with the pebble mine up in Alaska. It's a big copper gold mine. That thing's been a political football, okay? So what you need to do is you need to analyze companies from jurisdictional purposes where they are allowed to mine. Nevada, okay, Finland, Colombia, Mexico, there are jurisdictions that are pro-mining, okay, or relatively pro-mining. You want to be in companies that are there, okay? You don't want to be in companies or, or, or areas where, uh, you know, the federal government can come in and, you know, curb stomp you uh, like this. And, you know, and then in the same speech, talk about a, a, build, a build Back Better plan that requires hundreds of millions of tons of metals. Where are you going to get them? Because everybody's trying to do the same thing we're trying to do, and no one's allowing mining. There was a big mine in Serbia that got canceled. I think it was a big lithium mine that uh, that uh, uh, Rio Tinto was going to, uh, and, you know, that got overturned. So, you know, where are you going to get this stuff? No one talks about it. Certainly not these environmental people, not the Biden administration. I mean, Jennifer Granholm, who is the energy secretary, was on TV one time. I, I should have put it up here. And she was asked, you know, she didn't even know what the daily oil usage was for the United States. She has no clue. She's the energy secretary. That's how dumb these people are. And what is her claim to fame to be? She's, a, you know, another political hack that gets put in there because she's a woman and she was the governor of Michigan and she's a loyal Democrat and doesn't know a damn thing about energy. And this is who you're relying on? You think that these people are going to solve these problems? This is these distortions in the economy, these distortions in the markets are tradable. Trading off these idiots' decisions and these poor policies is how you make speculators make money. So this is going to be another thing that becomes more and more of the discussion this year and into next year. Global food prices are going nuts. And we know that when they get to a certain level, which they've reached, that we start seeing political turmoil because of the uh, high high food prices. And we've been talking about this. This hasn't even reached the mainstream yet, but this is coming. Here's from uh, Crescat Capital. It's a little bit showing you kind of a breakout happening here. Um, yeah, this is going to go higher. This is going to be an issue. And if you follow the ag markets like I do, you know, we've seen some crop failures. We've seen issues with the coffee crop in Brazil that got frozen out. We're seeing some drought conditions. We're seeing, you know, plantings not happening. Uh, we saw the OJ uh, crop get uh, hit with the frost this year. So what I'm telling you is, is that we've had 10, 15 years of outstanding growing conditions around the world. And that looks to be reversing now. Whether you want to call it climate change, whether you want to call it the sunspot cycle, whatever you want to call it, it's happening. And it's going to become increasingly difficult to supply the necessary food to feed everyone. This doesn't help the situation, right? We've been talking about this. Um, Russia to ban exports of ammonium nitrate for two months starting from February 2nd, which was a couple of days ago. Why? Because they want to make sure that they have sufficient fertilizer for their grain crops. You're going to see more of this, not less of it. You're going to see more resource nationalism. You're going to see this. OK, this country, Russia, is a major producer of 
various commodities. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, that kind of, I think this is the last slide. Yeah. This kind of segues into something that I, I've been buying Russian stocks. I've been buying the RSX. I do not believe there's going to be an invasion of, <laughs> of Eastern Ukraine by the Russians. It's not going to happen. Um, you see what the, the NATO countries are not interested, Germany, France, they're not interested in having Ukraine in NATO. It's not going to happen. This is the U.S., another one of these schemes. They're scheming this thing up to take the attention. Watch over here, everybody. Watch over here. Don't watch over here. You know, don't watch over here. Watch, 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 watch the rabbit. Watch the rabbit while they stick it in and break it off. OK. Um, and people get played. You know, I'm still waiting for the weapons of mass destruction to be found in Iraq. OK, uh, it was an interesting uh, I don't I don't know the reporter's name. It was on Twitter. I probably should have saved it. This was very good. It was a State Department official was up there. It was a press briefing. And this guy, this shill, this hack, this liar. Is standing up there talking about, well, we have information declassified information that the Russians are planning a false flag event to give an excuse to roll into Eastern Ukraine. And so one of the reporters there, which I forgot the guy's name, he goes, what information do you have? Well, we have information. We're, we're, we're briefing you right now. What specific information do you have? You said it's declassified. And he just went round and round with this hack from the State Department. And he he, he, he looked horrible. And so what did the guy from the State Department do to this reporter? You, you're a Russian propagandist. Look, why, why, would, why, would the, why would Russia want to roll into eastern Ukraine and take it over? Why would they want to go all the way to Kiev? Why would they want to do that? Like I've said before, and people don't like to hear this because there's people that, you know, are living in the past. Uh, well, I'm a Czech or I, I was in Hungary and, you know, the Soviets were here. Yeah, that's over with. That's over with. Get over it. OK, that that's over with. Russia is a one point seven trillion dollar economy. OK, why do they want to take over eastern Ukraine and spend five hundred billion dollars over the next 20 years? I mean, the place is a disaster area. It's 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 a third world country in the villages. In the smaller cities and towns, it's a second world country. Yeah, you have high speed internet, but the water, you can't drink the water out of the faucet. I mean, you know, it's the dilapidated infrastructure. There's no industry there. Okay, it's all been decimated. It's all been stolen by these oligarchs in Kiev. Okay, and you're telling me the Russians want to roll in there? You saw what happened in Crimea. Everybody got a Russian passport, and the Russians ended up having to spend 50, 60 billion dollars rehabbing the joint. That, that, you know, that's a different story, though. Who, who wants to take over, you know, what, what, what should happen is, uh, what will eventually happen is this will die down and you'll have, continue to have the standoff and eventually Lugansk and Donetsk provinces, these places will end up having the autonomy that they are, that they were, was agreed to in the Minsk agreement, which you, the government of Ukraine is not complying with but you don't hear that in the news okay these things are always more complicated than they're made for your viewership on cnn and so before you render an opinion i see these people all over twitter people that don't speak russian don't know russia don't know russian history don't know russian politics don't know anything about anything giving comments okay you can go i know people that have went to, they are on the front lines. They are American citizens. They are over there on both sides fighting. Okay. You can go join the Azov battalion. Okay. They will let you fight. You can go to the Russian separatist side and they will let you fight. You can join a foreign brigade. Okay. No one's going to stop you from doing that. If that's what you're inclined to do, if you believe so deeply, you should go there and you should put your life on the line. Okay. But we're not going to send, uh, you know, we're not. Certainly, NATO, Europe is not going. I mean, how many combat brigades do we do they have? What are they going to do? OK, this is this is this is ridiculous. I mean, you already have Germany and some of these other NATO allies not even allowing overflights to bring the Javelin missiles from Latvia and stuff. So this whole thing's a joke. OK, it's a distraction to distract you from the policies, poor policies here in the United States. OK. So. Uh, yeah, I'm, I've been a buyer uh, of Russian stocks. Uh, I, I, you know, there still is a risk. Anything can happen. I don't know with 100% certainty what will happen, but I think that uh, it's oversold. 
And the next five years, Russia is going to be minting coin, the oil, the gas, the metals, the farm products. They're, sit, they're sitting in the cuckoo bird seat. Uh, you, I think you'll actually see, you know, if you want to trade, in, and I'm all about selling overvaluation and buying undervaluation, if you want the rest, the rest of the decade trade, short the U.S. and go long Russia. I think you would do well as a pair trade. So that's it uh, for this week, guys. Um, I hope you got something out of this. I kind of ran a little bit long, but uh, had a lot of good stuff to talk about this week. Um, and like I said, uh, we're following these trends in the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. Um, we're down already this year a little bit, but we're still outperforming the S&P, thankfully, uh, because we, you know, like we said, you know, when stocks go down, most stocks go down. Eventually, this thing will sort itself um, after we get through this liquidity issues. And but we will see, like I said, as I think as the year goes on, and as these commodity prices, I mean, you have nickel over ten dollars a, a pound now. No one's talking about this stuff. Um, you got coppers holding up. I mean, coppers at 440, 450 a pound. Okay. And supposedly we're having a global recession. Okay. I mean, we, we're, we're moving into the area, uh, into the era of, of supply issues. Okay. Not necessarily demand like we had in the previous commodity bull market last decade when China was building out their infrastructure and sucking up the world's uh, resources to do that. We're in a situation now that chronic underinvestment across the commodity space is going to lead to undersupply and rising prices. All right, guys, that's it for this week. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.